Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here, and I thought I'd do another one of these voiceover videos with my ASMR voice, which is pleasure for your ears. And today I thought I would talk with you guys a little bit about the topic of when is form breakdown acceptable, and what do we actually mean by form breakdown? Uh, because when we talk about form breakdown, I'm going to say that if your goal is to minimize risk of injuries while weight training, that bad form really isn't acceptable. It's not acceptable ever. Now, I understand that maybe in a competitive environment, it has to happen sometimes, and that's what we'll get to in a minute of when it is acceptable. Uh, but the whole topic itself, we need to understand, is there actually ever benefits to allowing your form to degradate? Because that's kind of the point. Because if we don't have any benefits at all, then there's no reason to even ponder it beyond that, since we know that bad form uh, increases a risk of injury. And that's not to say that every time you use it, there's a high chance or that every single exercise using some bad form is always going to have some major increase. We're talking oftentimes about a very small increase because heavy weight training is for the most part not as dangerous of an activity as it's been made out to be unless you're intentionally using horrific form. Uh, or you, you've created muscle imbalances, or you just simply try to use a weight that's too heavy, which again, oftentimes <laughs> results in bad form. So what we really need to explore is why do people allow form to degradate? And I would say more than anything, uh, it is because they're not capable of lifting the weight that they are trying to lift. And that's a relative term. That's a relative term because if we're talking about on a bench press, what do we mean by bad form? Bouncing the bar off your chest, is that bad form? Yeah, that's form breakdown. You're not capable of uh, benching it with a pause, so you bounce it off your chest, and that carries a degree of risk. How about stopping short of the bottom? Doing a partial rep because it gets too heavy. Yeah, that's bad form. How about shifting under the bar? Allowing yourself to slide to the side so that one side lifts a little faster than the other, and then you can shift your weight under it to push it up uneven. That's bad form. That's form breakdown. Or pretty much any situation in which the spotter is forced to touch the bar, and then maybe you even try to do another rep after that. Again, you start seeing form degradation. That's the problem. That's what we're talking about here. And that is almost always every single case that I just listed as an example of using a weight that is too heavy for you on that specific rep. Now, it could mean that it's heavier than your one rep max, and so you cheat in those ways to do that, but it could also mean that you've reached muscle failure. So if you've reached muscle failure and it's your eighth rep or 10th rep or 12th rep, the weight that you are trying to lift is now too heavy for your current muscle fibers. Well, that's form breakdown. The weight's too heavy. That's almost always the cause. It's almost always the cause. Uh, it forces you to cheat in some way, whether it's adding swing, adding extra leg drive, things like that. You are not strong enough to lift the weight anymore. And I'll talk in a minute what we mean about exercises that you intentionally use leg drive. That's a different situation. I'm talking about changing what you are doing in the middle of a set. That's what we're talking about here. In other words, your form changes. You don't do the same form all the way through. You allow it to break down. Well, a lot of people would say, well, I'm doing that to go ahead and further exhaust the muscles. There's no point in that. There's no point in that. If you have reached a state of momentary failure, you've already exhausted the muscle. In other words, if we are using really heavy weight for low reps, we're trying to get to the upper threshold fibers as quickly as possible uh, without a lot of concern for the endurance fibers. We're trying to lift maximum weight to get maximum strength, which, you know, does come with size as well. If we're doing reps or any sort of moderate to high reps, our goal is to go ahead and exhaust some of the slightly more strength stamina oriented fibers ahead of time. And then once they're exhausted, we start getting to the power fibers because that's what kicks in once you get several reps into a higher rep set. And then you've exhausted again a large number of muscle fibers. You've created all the metabolic fatigue that you want. You're not actually stimulating any more real growth by doing forced reps or cheating the weight up or any of that on the same set. In fact, all the studies we have seen show that if you take a nice long break and repeat the same set again with the same weight and reps, that actually elicits the most growth response. So this whole idea of trying to do that to grind out one, two, three more reps 
doesn't work because you've already exhausted the upper threshold fibers. There's no point in continuing that set. Uh, and there's no evidence out there that even shows that that's the case. In fact, we know that most of the evidence shows that stopping about one rep, in some cases two reps short of actual muscle failure, seems to give maximal muscle growth on any one set. The only reason you would take things to failure is because some people don't have the awareness to know when they're one rep away. In other words, uh, someone's true 10 rep max on which they would fail at 11th rep, that person might not be familiar enough with their body to know that rep seven, they still have two, two to three more reps in the tank and they might stop short. That is what has been noted in the study seems to be the only benefit to training to failure. If you reach a rep and you have to start cheating or do something to make lifting the weight easier, such as again, using a leg drive, bouncing it off your chest, swinging, changing the range of motion, shifting under the weight, you've reached muscle failure. You're not stimulating any additional muscle growth at that point. So it's a waste of time. Now, there are exercises in which we do cheat by using a consistent amount of body English or leg drive or other things to drive the weight up. A perfect example, we could compare a strict press, strict standing press, to a push press. A push press, you use leg drive to initiate the weight. The situation with that, though, is that the push press has a specific performance element. It actually helps develop things like the quads and hips, and it trains your nervous system to use them simultaneously with an overhead press. That has carryover to a lot of sports. You're actually training a sport-specific performance element. But here's the thing. If you're doing a push press, the amount of leg drive that you use should be fairly consistent from rep to rep. You're not using bad form. You're using the same form for the entire set, whether it's one rep, three reps, five reps, whatever you happen to be doing. And you probably are not going to do high reps on a push press. It doesn't make sense from a performance perspective to do that. It's a power-based movement. But that's an example of using a controlled cheat for a sport-specific outcome instead of doing a strict press. You are adding a, extra muscles in for a different performance element, and it has its own uh, dynamics to it. It has its own biomechanics. And you would be consistent with those also. So the same rule would apply to a push press. You're not having a bad form or form breakdown. You are doing a controlled amount of momentum uh, being done for a specific purpose, such as, again, training your body to use the quads and hips simultaneously with a press. And that could matter on a playing field. That could matter in a punch. That could matter in hitting someone in a football field. And then you have the eccentric overload that comes with it. So it has its own performance elements, and it's the same thing there. It's just that it should be consistent all the way through. Now the question becomes, so all of that being said, when is form breakdown acceptable? Sometimes when you are testing your limits. Uh, oftentimes on a linear progression program, you will allow for a small amount of form breakdown on one rep, and when your form breaks down, what do you do? You stop. And on a lot of linear progression programs, including my own, that's when you reduce the weight next time you come to the gym. You found your limits because you don't want the form to break down. You're no longer capable of doing the programmed reps and sets. So the form degradation is seen as a bad thing. It's something that's going to happen from time to time in a novice program, but it's not something that should be done intentionally. It's something you know is going to happen. And it's best to uh, learn to feel those things ahead of time in a novice program before you get really strong, in which case when you get stronger, the injury risk starts going up if you allow your form to get bad. So it's a learning tool for the novice, but in an ideal world, you wouldn't see much form breakdown, would you? You would just keep progressing without it happening. Uh, form breakdown might be acceptable also in a competitive environment. In other words, a powerlifting meet, you're going for your third attempt or an all-time PR or to hit that lift that you need to hit to win the meet, to win your place, to win your medal, uh, to hit your PR. 
there is a certain amount of form degradation that is acceptable there because what people need to remember there's a difference between training and competing when you are training your goal should always be to improve without getting hurt right that's the number one goal of all training is to make you better at what you're trying to do in a competitive environment the goal becomes to win and oftentimes in a truly competitive sports environment there is a degree of risk that is accepted and associated with giving 100 percent to win that is unfortunately the nature of the beast of a competitive environment but the difference here is that again we're talking about knowing that you are accepting a risk and there will be no training benefit to that. You are not going to improve as a result of that bad form that you did in the competitive environment. It is not going to benefit you in any way other than that metal. It's not going to make you bigger. It's not going to make you stronger. It might allow you to win. But you are accepting a risk should you choose to do it. There is a risk associated with it because no competitive sports endeavor is risk-free. And competition always carries with it a higher degree of risk than training does. And if you're getting hurt in training, or you're taking injury risk in your actual training, even as a competitor, you're being unwise and you're being short-sighted. You are not looking out for your own best interest, if that's the case. Because in training, our number one goal shouldn't be just to improve, it should be to stay injury free because nothing sets you back further than an injury. That's when you stop improving and you regress. That's the opposite of what we want. All right, guys, but that's really all I have to say on that today. I hope it's been informative and I will talk to you guys next time.